So welcome and thank you for being here on this um, day, uh, Yom HaShoah on Day of Remembrance. Um, I'm here with you to share a story, uh, a story of suffering, a story of courage, a story of faith, a story of compassion, and a story of tolerance. Um, and also just want to share with you that the, one of the most important things, that one thought, one act, one person can change the world. I'm here to share with you the story of uh, my mother, uh, Stefania Podgorska, and her little sister, Helena, and my father, uh, Joseph Berzminski, at the time he was Max Diamant. Let's see, let's see if I can make this work. Ah, that's my mom, Stefania, on the right, and her little sister, Helena. In, that's, uh, I think, in the 1940s. They came from a little town in Poland called Lipa, which is now near the Ukrainian border. It's a little farm town, and she was actually a, a farm girl. She was a farm girl with big city dreams. She wanted to get out of that farm life and go to the big city. Well, for her, the big city was Przemysl in southeastern Poland, uh, not too far away from the big city named Lvov, which is now in uh, Ukraine. So she went there uh, to visit with her sisters who were already there working. She was probably in her early teens when she went there. She was so taken by the city, the hustle and the bustle. It was, it was her thing, the energy of the city. Soon she got a job uh, at a, um, that was owned by the Diamonds a Jewish family, um, yep, there we go, a Jewish family. There was um, uh, Isaac, there was um, Leah, there was Chaim, and there was uh, Isidore on his little horse, there was Henrik sitting down, there was Max standing up, and um, oh my gosh, what's my aunt's name? I'll come back to it. I'm drawing a blank on my aunt's name. Well, I never knew her. So this group owned a little grocery store uh, in Przemysl, and they would serve little uh, pastries, they'd serve food, they'd sell all kinds of little different things. It was a common thing in Poland, in southeastern Poland, to have these little shops all over the place. So uh, Steffi, it was a short name, Stefania, they called her Steffi, Stefusha, and sometimes then they would shorten it down to Fusha. So if you hear me referring to her as Steffi, Fusha, it's kind of interchangeable because it just, I can't keep one name straight with her. So Steffi worked in this little shop. And then, then there was Isidore, one of the sons. His nickname was Iju. He was a, a cute guy. He was a fun guy. And Steffi and Iju, um, were a thing. They fell in love. And the Diamonds welcomed this, um, uh, this Catholic girl. Uh, they didn't get married, but they, she welcomed the, they welcomed her into their family, working at the store, dating Iju. It was all good. Everybody was having fun. Um, and sure enough, then, things got bad. World War II broke out and the Nazis came. Things weren't good for Jews in Poland in 1941 and 1942 and, and later. Things, it really wasn't a good time to be Jewish in Poland at the time. Very horrific things happened, um, as I'm sure you all, all know. This was the entrance to the ghetto, and I'm sure you've all seen pictures of people who are being herded and rounded up into the ghetto and they are carrying all of their possessions on carts and, and such. Um, the Diamat family, um, they were doing the same thing. They carried a whole bunch of stuff with them. Um, they had lived in a little apartment. They trusted um, Fusha, Steffi, so much. They wanted her to live in that apartment, to take care of it until the war was over. In that ghetto, there were thousands of people that were herded into a small area where the Nazis could keep them and stage them 
until they were moved onto transports. But one of the things that um, Chaim, the older brother, uh, would play was a violin. And he had this violin that he bought, we think it was either in Italy or in Vienna, we're not sure exactly where it was, but apparently he played quite well. And the family enjoyed his music. So they took the violin with them to um, the ghetto. They didn't play very often, I don't think. We never heard much about the story about the violin in the ghetto. But um, that's the violin was right there. It was exhibited. Um, and it was a special violin because it survived through the ghetto. It survived through the war. Uh, I remember my dad playing it, my dad Max, playing it at home when I was a kid. He didn't play all that well, but he played it. I played it. I played horribly. I, I played with it. <laughs> I didn't play it. I strummed it like a ukulele. Those are my memories of the violin. But apparently, um, when the ghetto was being liquidated, what they called the action, where the Jews were being rounded up and moved to the trains, my father Max and his brother Chaim decided to bury the violin. They wanted to come back and get it after the war. I guess they didn't really know exactly what was going on, what was happening to them. So they buried it. To make a long story short, my dad survived, Max survived, and he came back after the war and he dug up the violin. And there it is. Um, this is the apartment where the Diamants lived. Um, and uh, it's where Stefania and her, uh, her sister later uh, came to live. Let's go. <laughs> That's OK. So this is an aerial view. I just thought this was kind of interesting. The re red circle is where the apartment is, where um, Steffi lived. The purple circle is the, where the train station is with, uh, and the, the, the place where the Germans would collect the, Jew the Jews to, to load them on the train. And the green circle is the ghetto. So Steffi could look out the window. She could look over the train tracks and see the ghetto and see all the stuff that was kind of going on over there. She was in touch with Max and his, uh, his family. Uh, she would go into the ghetto. She would sneak in. She would get them food. Uh, it was dangerous for her. Um, and, but she was, she loved their son. She loved the family. The family loved her. So there's Iju again showing up. Um, he, there was, uh, uh, Max was supposed to be taken to a labor camp uh, in Lvov, labor camp called Yanovska. And it was, uh, it was a very hard labor camp. Well, Max was not doing so well. I guess he was a little bit sick. So his brother Iju, who was younger, said, I'll go in his place. And um, he went on the, I guess it was on a train, to uh, go over to this labor camp in Yanovska. Well, Steffi was, um, she was crushed by this because she you know, was still in love with, with him. Oh, back up. So, uh, Steffi would go, she went over there to Yanovska. She got on a train once and, and hauled on over there to see him. And she was able to actually bribe one of the guards to get him. And she saw him, she talked with him. He said, you gotta get me out of here. This place is just, it's horrible, I'm gonna die here. We're all gonna die here. So Steffi planned, Steffi and he planned um, a way to get him out. She was going to come. She was going to bring some clothes. She was going to bribe that guard again to bring him. And he was going to escape. They got it timed at a certain time and a day when they were going, when Fusha was going to be there. Steffi was going to come. Now, the Germans were, mon were, were running the railroads. And the railroads were right on time, right on schedule. But the one day, there was a problem with the railroads. So Steffi was delayed. She was delayed by about six hours. She came to the camp, and the guard saw her, and he said, what, you're late. He's dead. 
She was devastated, clearly. Um, she was furious, she was devastated. She's, a late train caused her this to happen, of all things. So she went back to Tremish, she went back to the apartment, and um, she was thinking, what could she do? Her mother and her uh, siblings, who were, still, who were in Lipa, they were taken away to a work camp in Germany, of all places, so they were working there. But they left her, their little sister with a neighbor, Helena. So Steffi is thinking to herself, she gets a letter, she says, go check on Helena. She goes over, she makes this walk to Lipa. I drove it, it's about a 40 minute drive. It's about a half day walk. She walked all the way down there, through woods and that kind of thing. She came to the, the neighbor's house where Helena was and she was not doing very well. She took Helena and they walked back to Przemysz. It was a long walk for a little girl. She was about seven at the time, Helena was. And they made it back uh, at night after curfew. They were waiting outside of town and Steffi was thinking, should I go or should I wait? Helena was tired, she had passed out in the street and Steffi yelled, Hella! And these Nazi soldiers came over wondering what was going on. And my mother was so distraught that she just said, she's passed out, she's tired, I don't know what's wrong. So they actually ended up taking, picking up Helena, these soldiers picked up Helena and took Steffi to a clinic, to a hospital of all places. She didn't know where she was going, but she ended up at this hospital. And she was waiting in the, in the waiting room for a little while. It was a room, it wasn't like a hospital waiting room, it was a, 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 like a school that was taken over as a hospital. She didn't know what was gonna happen to them. And a doctor came out and he looked Helena over. He, he told her that it was, she was just exhausted, she was emaciated, she needed some food. He actually brought her some stuff to make her better. And I wanna mention this, it's important about compassion. This one doctor made it very clear to my mom, he doesn't agree with this war. He did, he's only there because they threatened his family if he didn't show up. So that's why he's there. And that was, not all Germans were bad. This guy was not. And he actually came to the house or to the apartment to check up on Helena the following day or two days later to make sure she was okay. This was a good guy. He was a good doctor in a bad situation. So I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. That was Helena, he, she went back to get her. They're both living in the um, apartment, Hella and Steffi. And this guy, one of the, Ma the Diamant clan show up, Max. He was a um, mischievous kind of guy. Uh, he was older than Iju. Turns out he uh, and his siblings were rounded up in the second action in the ghetto. And they were gonna be taken away on a train. It was November, uh, November 18th, 1942. So a group of Jews hid. They didn't want to be taken on the train. They hid in a, in a cellar um, in the ghetto. So the Nazis were going around and they were checking to see uh, who was hiding. And anybody that was hiding that didn't get on the train, they were shot. They were just executed. So there were Polish soldiers, Polish policemen who were working with the Germans. And they were going around and they were sticking bayonets into um, little windows, their basement windows. And um, there was a, a hay bale in one of the windows. And this, this Polish guy was shoving in the bayonet saying, anybody in there come out or, or I'll throw a grenade in and I'll kill everybody. So my, uh, these people were in there. Max tells everybody to sh sh be quiet. And there was a lady with uh, a small child with her. She panicked. She pushed her daughter out the window. So the cop sees it, and he calls over this German patrol, this SS patrol. And the woman is coming out saying, okay, we're coming out, we're coming out, don't hurt us, don't hurt us. And the SS, one of the SS men took the little girl and stomped on her uh, right out on the sidewalk. And obviously the mom freaked out. Everybody was freaked out and the um, SS men 
took all these people and they marched them to what's called the Umschlagplatz. The Umschlagplatz is uh, just a name, uh, a place where you'd congregate. Um, that's where the Nazis would load people onto the trains. So what Max and his brother Chaim were doing, they were walking over there, they were going to get shot. These SS men were going to shoot them for hiding. All of these people. So they stood in this Umschlagplatz area, and Chaim tells Max, put your heart out, stick your chest out towards the barrel of the gun, because they only take one shot. And if they miss and you're still alive, then they're going to throw your body into, or you're going to throw you into a pit. So you want to make sure you get killed. So as these soldiers were raising their rifles to shoot at all these people, a higher ranking SS man comes over. And, you know, actually, instead of me telling the story, but I want you to hear it in his voice rather than mine. My brother, and on purpose, deliberately, we tried to face the muzzles of the rifles so we should be shot through our hearts. Why? Because we knew that they shoot only one bullet and whoever survives is not shot, is buried alive. And then they put lime on the on top of the bodies. At the last moment, a group of SS people came and they asked, what's going on here? And one of them said that they had pulled 50 Jews out of a bunker and they were going to shoot them according to instructions. The commander of the SS people replied, these are fat Jews, all of them are good for soap. And then they took us to a train, a transport train, which had not left yet. The loading was as follows. These were Russian freight uh, train cars, tall cars. There were no steps, and everyone had to lift the other and put him into the wagon. All around there were SS people with dogs and I saw one group before they entered the wagons. In that group there was an old woman and at a certain moment an SS man set the dog against her. The dog jumped at her, bit her, clawed out, bit out a piece of flesh out of the lower part of her body and brought that piece of flesh to his owner. This woman, out of fright, she screamed and jumped into the wagon on top of the other people. They laughed. When we were loaded, more than 100 of us, they sealed off the wagon. No, Mr. Hausner, Dr. Buzinski, you knew this was a death train, didn't you? Why did you enter these cars? Answer, we were helpless. Our morale was completely broken. They had prepared us for months on end so that at, on hearing their voice, very voices, we began shaking and trembling. 
Nie mogli w ogóle opanować się. Hajtazo, it was a kibucit, veritable collective psychosis, which one could not overcome. Wagoni, to ludzie stłoczeni, zduszeni byli, a przed wagonem stali Ukraińcy, którzy pilnowali i stali Niemcy. Inside the car, we all crowded together, and there were Ukrainians in front of the wagons. Śmiali się, mówili, no, będziemy mieli dużo mydla i na gulasz wszystko jedzie. And they laughed and said, now we shall have lots of soap. All are going to be made into gulasz. Mr. Hausner, Mr. Guszmiński, Dr. Guszmiński, you jumped out of that train. Yes. Question, you went into a wood, you hid there and returned to Przemysl, right? Answer, yes. Mr. Hausner, we shall make this brief. I just wanted to have a few details. I just want to get to the end of your testimony. After some time, you entered the bunker together with another number of people. Isn't that so? And there was a Polish woman there who hid you. Ja najpierw wróciłem do tej kobiety Polki, bo nie miałem gdzie wrócić. Answer. First, I returned to this Polish woman. I did not have anywhere else to turn. She was alone. Her father had been killed, and the other members of her family were transferred to Germany to forced labor. She stayed behind with a little sister, aged seven. When she saw me bleeding and broken, she, she had been my neighbor earlier where I lived. She received me, washed me, and gave me a place to sleep, Mr. Hausner. And you stayed there until the Soviet army liberated Przemysl? It was a little long, but um, that Adolf Eichmann, that guy sitting there, for those of you who don't know, he was, um, he was a really bad guy. He was very high up in the SS, and he was responsible for... Uh, a lot of the final solution to get rid of the Jews. Do you see the look on his face as he's sitting there? There was one thing that the translator didn't catch when the, the lawyer asked, why, didn't, why did you get on the train? The first thing my father said was, we didn't have weapons. That's an important thing to consider. We had no guns. And the other thing was they were trained to the barking, the command voice of the Germans. Raus! Right? That made you jump. And if you hear that over and over and over, it scares the crap out of you. They were terrified. I had the very good fortune of being an extra on a movie um, about the Holocaust. And it was out in a, I was out in the field. I was just a Jewish guy out in the field, a laborer. And there were three got soldiers with a uh, German shepherd kind of at the tree line. And there were 20 of us working in the field. We were standing about 15 feet apart. And I'm thinking to myself, there's only three soldiers. This would have been easy to, to run off. Why didn't people run off? And then I got to thinking about it. There are three soldiers with rifles. I shoot. And I know if you're in an open field, if somebody starts, or if a dog or whatever runs, they don't have a chance. So even with three people, three soldiers, 20 prisoners, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't take the risk. It, was a, it really was a kind of a terrible time. Whoops, OK. So back at the apartment, um, Steffi, she needed to get some work. So she had to get work papers. But she was too young. So she had to come up with a way to fake her age. The Nazis said, you know, you need to have work documents in order to work. So she ended up having a friend help her get um, some false papers. And these are her work papers, the Kentkarte, as it's called. And that's her in 1942. Uh, I, she, I believe she was 16 or 17. 
and she made herself out to be 20. So she got to work making bolts. She was a machinist. And she was feeding Max, who ended up staying there um, with, with her in the apartment. And then Max's remaining brother, uh, Henik, came. And Henik's fiance, Danuta, came. And then they didn't have enough room. She was like, wait, this is a one-room apartment. What are we going to do? She's got to find a place for them. So they move, she's running around, and she finds this place for rent on Tatarska Street, Tatarska number three. This rundown place, in the back, there was a two-room apartment for rent. Two rooms, a kitchen, outhouse, no electricity, but there was an attic. Aha, now that's a good place where you can hide some people. So they slowly started to migrate over there. She rented the place, um, and Max, started to um, build a little partition in the attic. Um, Steffi and her sister Helena managed to find some old wood, and Max was in his late 20s, uh, and he had been a dental student, so he was kind of handy. Um, and so he builds this little partition, and it was perfect for holding people. That's Steffi in the attic when we went to visit it in 1984. You can see, um, you, that's me in the corner taking a picture, and you can see kind of on the left where there's like a little um, change in color from the wall. That's how far the, the wall extended, and it went all the way and covered up that one window. And it was about six feet high, down to about two feet at the bottom. And there were ultimately 13 people that were in there for like 18 months. Now, there was no bathroom, so they had to Use a bucket, 13 people in the summer, in a hot, sweaty summer. He, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. So my, uh, my aunt, her sister Helena, was tasked sometimes with taking the bucket out to the outhouse and dumping it. And then there was getting food for all these people. How do you feed all these people? How do the neighbors not think, what's all this food doing going in there? What's going on? So they just, they figured it all out. They came up with stories that they were buying and selling to make money. Uh, that's why all this food was coming in, and it was going out in small parcels. So they were just coming up with all these stories. While mom was, while Steffi was working at the, at the factory, you know, she was kind of a coquettish lady. She was, she was cute, she was fun, she liked to dance, she liked to sing. So there were some suitors, some boys liked her. She wanted to go out. She couldn't. And there just happened to be one boy who was persistent. And um, uh, she ended up, a friend of hers worked at a photo studio. She went there, and there was a picture of an SS man, a headshot. She took it. So this one Polish boy from the factory came over to, to this place where all the Jews were upstairs. And he sees this picture of this SS man on the table. Steffi was crushed because he looked at her as a traitor. He said, how could you? He says, you're horrible. And he left. And she's left with her people upstairs. What does she do? I mean, it's just, I have, growing up with this woman, they were my parents. They were nutty, you know? Was, we do Christmas. We do a little bit of Hanukkah. No, we didn't really do Hanukkah. He went to light the candles. But it was kind of, you know, it was funky at home. And, um, but looking back, it's like, oh my gosh, how could these people have done this for two years doing all this stuff? With this little girl. And the little girl had to run back and forth to the ghetto. The way the people would come, there was, a, there was kind of a signal. Um, one of the little girls was supposed, uh, there was a girl who was coming. Well, the signal was, um, there was an address that was written on a piece of paper. The signal was going to be my mom, uh, uh, my mom was supposed to bring this piece of paper over and sneak it through the gate or through the barbed wire fence to get it over to one of the girls who was going to come over. Well, there was a changing of the guards. Steffi knew all these guards, but they all changed. Now they're new soldiers. So Helena volunteers. She says, nobody will figure out a girl 
I'll just go and play. She's over there at the fence of the ghetto. She's kicking a little ball around, playing, and the Germans aren't really paying attention to her until somebody notices that she's doing something. She's handing somebody a note through the fence. That's when the Germans start coming after her. And she starts running away. And this one SS guard um, grabs her. So she kicked him, and she bit him. <laughs> ah! This little eight-year-old girl bit this soldier. And she's running, but she has this note with the address. And if she gets caught, everybody's dead. So this little kid, on the fly, eats the paper. She just scarfs it down. They catch her, they beat her, and then, they, then she goes home. You know, can, like, can, you, can you imagine your kid coming home all beat up? <laughs> you know? But you would have bit the guy, right? So I mean, you, know, you go through these things and it's like, holy smokes, the story just keeps getting crazier and crazier and crazier. So then there was one day um, where the, um, the building across the street was a school, a municipal building. It got turned into a hospital, military hospital by the Nazis. And these two SS men show up at Steffi's door and tell her, you've got two hours to leave because we need rooms for nurses. And it's just you two, so you guys can hit the road. We're taking over. So uh, here's another short little uh, clip, because I don't want to tell the story. I'd rather have my mom tell the story. It's a story of love and dedication, which started when hate and brutality ruled. Stefania Bodgorska was a Catholic teenager when Hitler invaded Poland and began rounding up Jews to send to death camps. Her friend, Joseph Brzezminski, escaped from a train and turned up on her doorstep. Unable to turn him away, she hid him and ultimately 12 other Jews in her attic for two years. After Poland was liberated, Steffi and Joe were married. And Steffi and Joe join us today. Steffi and Joe, now married for 50 years. One day, came to me two SS men, and they said to me, they gave me only two hours to move out of my apartment. Oh. And I asked why. They said, because they opened, they, uh, opened the military hospital across my home and they needed apartments for their, their personality, for themselves. Around that was family, and he said that we are only two girls, so we can go out. And they gave me two hours. And you know all these people are in your attic. <laughs> well, she was holding us. So, so what did you do? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wait, okay. <clears throat> So they, this SS man said, if they will come with two hours and I will be still the, at home, they will kill me and my sister. I, I said, all right. I didn't have choice. When they left, I went to the attic. I told my people what happened. Two hours they gave me to move out of my apartment. So all 13 came to me, embraced me around, and they said, listen, Steffi, you have to run away. Take your little sister. You cannot help us anymore, but save yourself and your sister. We probably have to die. There's no choice, but you not have to. You cannot help us anymore. Take your sister and go run away. <sighs> I said, first of all, I will run to the city and ask maybe it will be some apartment. And I ran and I look around and here and there and in two hours you cannot find apartment. Right. I can find, I can go to, to, to my friends for a few days before later I can find. But you can't take 13 but people. 13 people. Right. I I just also, I, I couldn't leave them. So 
was 15 minutes left. I can, came home and I told them, no apartment. And they all still came around me. They said, run away, you have still 10 minutes. Run away, don't stay, don't, you don't have to die with us, run away. And some of the cry was three children and they look at me and they touched me and they, they hold me. They didn't say nothing, but they, they squeezed me. And I look on these 13 people and I felt inside, I cannot leave them. So what There's happened? People. What happened? And I told them, I will not leave you. And they were like a shock. I said, go on the attic, go to your bunker and stay quiet. We will see what will be. I will not leave you. So when the SS men came back, what happened? SS man came back exactly two minutes and uh, they said that's all right that I had not uh, uh, moved because they will take only one room and in the other room I can stay with my sister. Miracle. Oh, that's a miracle. <sighs> that is a miracle. So, I mean, those kinds of things were just like crazy. Um, I just want to share a couple more things. Um, they ended up, obviously everybody survived. Um, they were liberated by the Soviets. Uh, a couple of Soviet soldiers came in uh, and into the house. And Steffi comes, down, comes out and says, you know, are you you're Soviets? They said, yes. Are you know, any Germans here? She says, no. And he's, the people started to come out of the attic. And the soldier got all like, scared. Well, who is this? And she says, no, they're Jews. She said, they, they've been here. And he said, I'm a Jew. So the Soviet soldier was a Jew, and there was like, it was a happy kind of uh, ending. They moved, they ended up moving to Boston. Um, it was such a, a gift from God for them to move to the States. They were so grateful to come to the States. Um, my dad became a dentist. He was a dentist in Poland. He had to go to school all over again. Uh, at like 48, he had to go to dental school all over again in the 60s from a Soviet country to go to school with a bunch of 20-year-olds saying, oh, you're a communist, aren't you? And he didn't speak the language very well. Um, but a, after a while, you know, he, he did well. They bought a little apartment building. Um, no. They bought an apartment building where he had his office on the first floor, we lived on the second floor. He, they bought, he bought her some furs, he bought some jewelry, and I'm thinking, oh, dad's doing great. Now I look back, they were preparing. They had a building, they had a basement, they had furs to trade, they had jewelry to trade. There was, every time there was a sale, oh my gosh, you should have seen the, the, the two liter Coke stuffed all over the house, the cash stuffed all over the house. I mean, there was just stuff all over the place. It's like, Mom, what's wrong with you? No, it's okay, it's on sale. <laughs> All right, it's on sale. <laughs> but the preparation paid off because their compassion continued. There was a fire in an apartment building around the corner from us, a big building. There was like 50 units in the building. And everybody was displaced, and it was a, a, a rainy night. And I went out there, I'm looking at it, seeing all these people. I knew the guy from the Red Cross. Um, talked with him. He says, well, we don't know where these people are going to go. So I went home and told my parents what was going on. And I got to tell you, they really did not even say a word. They just kind of looked at me, and they looked at each other, and they said, bring them. Bring who? Bring them. As many as want to come. All right. So nine people that we didn't know came over. Unfortunately, we had a, they had a basement. We had a basement, so it was a finished basement. Um, they stayed in there for a couple of weeks. Fed them, gave them, until they got on, uh, up on their feet. One lady didn't want to leave. She was comfortable. <laughs> Come on, let's go. So she left. Um, and then I also want to share with you one story uh, of like incredible compassion that I was just, my mind was blown by this. So after all the stuff that my dad had gone through, he had lost people in his family. They had seen so much death. They had seen so much destruction. Um, I had thought to myself, if I ever come across somebody who has that kind of 
Nazi mentality. Um, I, you know, I was young, I was kind of, I'd say, I'm going to put a bullet in their head. He was like, Rrr, Rrr. So when I moved to Los Angeles in the early 90s, I ended up um, going, uh, learning to scuba dive. And uh, in my scuba class was this really big, burly German guy. He had a girlfriend who was a Filipino. My girlfriend was Filipino. So we kind of hit it off. We were going scuba diving together and all that kind of stuff. And then one evening, I won't share his name because I haven't talked with him about, you know, but this is a story. We're driving through the Fairfax district of Los Angeles. It's a very Jewish district and it was Friday night. So he and I are sitting in the front seat of his car and his girlfriend is in the back seat. My girlfriend wasn't with us. And these two Orthodox Jews are walking across the street with the pesos and everything. So we're quiet, we're watching them go across the street. His girlfriend's name was Ruby. He just sort of sits there and says, Ruby won't let me burn them. Excuse me, what? Adolf didn't finish the job. So I lit into him. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were Jewish. Uh, you don't have a Jewish way about you. Huh? So there was a lot of anger. Um, drove me home. And the next day, I called my dad in Boston. And I told him what, you know, what had happened. I said, you know, Pop, I've been waiting for this. And they, you know, it's, I'm going to do it. So my dad was silent on the phone. And he says, is he your friend? I said, he was my friend. I hate no more. So my dad was silent for a moment. And he says, be his friend. Huh? What? He says, be his friend. He says, don't perpetuate the hatred. And he said, maybe you can teach him something. I'm thinking, good God, what this, how can this man be telling me this? And um, I said, all right, for you, OK, I'll do that. So he and I got to talking. We shared our stories. It turns out his parents were prominent Nazis. Uh, and his story, his side of the story was they said, you either run with the dogs or you run with the wolves, or you're eaten by the wolves. I took it with a grain of salt, but I listened to his story. He listened to my story. Um, he got to know my dad. Uh, my dad came out to visit. They kind of became pals. They tell jokes to each other. My dad was small. This guy was big. I mean, he was big, burly guy. Yeah, come on, let's go play. So um, he went, I'll call him Hans. Hans ended up going back to Germany to work for his father's construction company. He was in the middle of Germany. He came back a couple of years later, and we had lunch. And he says to me, you know, you guys really opened my eyes. I went back, and he said, that's all the people were talking about. That's how we talked. That's what I grew up with, the hatred. He said. And he actually started to cry. This big, burly guy starts to weep. He wasn't sobbing, but he was weeping. And I started to weep. And it's like, you know, my dad was right. He was right. Because I, I could have been angry. I could have been hateful. And I could have done something really stupid. Um, but, you know, so I, it all ended up working out. Uh, and that's, that's a story of, of compassion and tolerance, because my dad was tolerant uh, in that moment. And he had every reason not to be. But um, so after all this happened, uh, some of the uh, people who were rescued got together in the 1970s, talked to Yad Vashem. My mom was recognized as a righteous Gentile. Um, and um, uh, there was a movie made uh, in her name, or not in her name, I mean about her story. It's called Hidden in Silence, and it's available. I don't get anything out of it, but it's available on um, Prime, Amazon Prime. Um, it's, it's amazing, because people are still commenting about it. Oh, this is a lie. Oh, this is the best movie. Oh, this is a It's like, oh, yeah, OK. At least they're commenting. They're engaging. Um, she, spoke, she spoke at the dedication of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. So here's this little farm girl from east, you know where, Poland. Um, and here she's on stage with Bill Clinton, and so is my dad. 
You know, and she got to meet the Clintons, got to meet, um, you know, pr presidents of multiple different nations. Um, Scholastic Press is writing a, a novel in about her. It's going to come out in March 2020. We don't get anything out of it, just her name being put, you know, out there. My goal is to keep her story going. Keep the story going because it touches people, it's inspirational, um, and... Um, but one of the things I also will just share before I wrap up, what my mom did, she sacrificed herself for this because she dealt with a bunch of post-traumatic stress afterwards. The PTSD was horrific. Uh, of course, she didn't talk about it as, as you, you don't go to psychiatrists from that era. Um, I went to a therapist. I ended up finding a guy who wrote a book on children of Holocaust survivors. Hey, I need you, but I'm not a ho child of a Holocaust. It's kind of odd. So he, was, he had his office in L.A. I said, all right, I'll go. So we went. We talked. I saw him for about six months. It was a good ther therapist. He leads you to your own answers. Six months, it was good. I had the good fortune of bringing my parents to my final session. Oh, there, that was fun. So my dad, yes, I want to get this off my chest. I want to live. I want to, you know, I, I want to live the rest of my life in happiness. I have children. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I want to talk to you more. And then Aaron, the therapist, turns to my mom. And Steffi, what about you? No. I don't have problem. You have problem. <laughs> Just like that. You have problem. She gets up, storms out of the room. And I got to tell you, for me, that was the end of my therapy because I had the epiphany. It's their life. It's not my life. They lived what they lived through, but I don't have to keep living it. But now, actually, as an adult, um, I feel it's almost like um, I'm the steward. My sister and I are the stewards of their story. So um, thank you for inviting me here, Jeffrey, to share the story. Um, anybody have a question? Yeah, I have like a ton. 50, but can I limit it to like three? Uh, quick, three quick ones. Number one, at what age did your parents start telling you their story? Very good question. So um, I used to be into models, building scale models and that kind of thing. And I think I was about 10 or 12, 11. Uh, yeah, probably 10 or 11. And there was this model of a German Tiger tank that I really wanted. And it was big. And it was nice. And my mom said, OK, okay yeah, let's, we can buy. I think it was $20 at the time, which was a lot back then. You know? um, so I see them go off to the corner. <laughs> Okay, we'll buy it. <laughs> I had an inkling, but I really learned about it in 1979 when Yad Vashem gave them the notoriety and she, they got um, national attention. So that's when I really learned the whole thing. But, and, and why did your father go back to Israel? Another good question that I didn't mention. There was Max Ber Diamant and Joseph Berzminski. So Max Diamant is a very Jewish name. And after the war, there were people that were still going after and chasing down Jews um, and actually killing them. So my dad ended up carrying a gun, which he didn't want to, but you know he, that was what you had to do. And he said he got chased by people, he shot at them. He says, I don't want to do that. So he, to my knowledge, what he told me, Joseph Berzminski is the name of a dead Polish soldier. So he took that name. And that's what the name means to me. It doesn't really mean anything to me. I've wanted to change it back. My sister changed it back. But I've gone my whole life with this name, and it's like, I don't know. It's stuck. All right, my third question. Yes. When did they get the loud back? Yes. Louder, yes. When did they get the violin back? The question is, when did they get the violin back? Uh, it was after the war. Um, after the war ended, Max, Max, my dad, went back to where they buried it. And dug it up. Yes. Yes. How much did your parents contribute, if at all, I'm sure it was somewhere, how much did your parents contribute to the film? Oh. Because the film does support what you're saying. Um, we watched the film for our congregation. Oh, OK. Yeah, you watched Hidden in Silence. OK. How much did my parents contribute? This is just a, uh, an illustration that my dad did of my of, Stephanie and 
and Helena as angels protecting the 13. How much did my parents contribute to the movie? Um, uh, they were interviewed extensively by the producer. It took the producer 10 years to get the movie made because my, my mom, Disney got interested in it. And my mom said, no, they're going to make it a love story. This is not a love story. This is a human story. So we're all saying, mom, it's Disney. Come on. <laughs> no. No. OK. So we waited until the right group of people came along and made the story. So there was a lot of interviewing, a lot of that going on. And I had the good fortune of being an extra on the movie. So I went over there. And it, tell me if I'm going long. Just get the hook and pull me off. But uh, uh, I was in LA, and the, the movie was being filmed in the Czech Republic. So I called up the producer. I said, I want to go and be in the movie. She says, oh, Ed, come on. Everybody's cast. You don't know how to act. No, 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 no. I want to be an extra. I just want to experience it. So I got on a plane. I went over to the Czech Republic. I went up to Hradec Králova, this little town. Got off the train, and there's, there's this Nazi flag hanging from a building. Whoa. People walking by, getting scared looking at that thing. I walked into the wardrobe bus, and um, they asked me, what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Do you want to be uh, a German or a Jew? I hadn't thought about that, actually. So they said, I said all right, let me try being a German. So they actually had an SS officer's coat that was a real coat from World War II. And they, I, they put it on me. OK, so I'm half Jewish. So half of the genes in my body are standing up going, no! And the Polish genes in my body are going, are you out of your mind? It really felt, Bleh. no, 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 no. I'm just going to be a guy in the ghetto. So that's who I ended up being. But I ended up meeting the guy who plays my dad. And he, first thing he asks me, Tom Radcliffe is his name. He, he finished a scene. He comes over to me. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Is your dad coming? No, no, no. It's too, too long of a trip. But I'm going to talk to him tonight. Do you want to talk to him? Yeah. OK, so we're up in a room. We're on the cell phone. I use the producer's cell phone because that's an expensive call. Um, <laughs> And I called my dad. I'm talking to my dad and telling him you know, what, what I'm seeing and who I'm sitting with. And I said, Max Diamant, I want to introduce you to Max Diamant. So I handed Tom the phone. And I left the room. He said hello, and they started talking. I came back about 10 minutes later. Tom is in tears. He's a wreck. He's just crying. He's sobbing. He's like, it's, it's, all, it's a mess. He's got... So he gives the phone back to me. And my father talks to me. He tells me a few things. But then he says, give Tom a hug for me. I lost it. I'm a wreck. Tom's a wreck. My dad loses it. He's a wreck. We're all sobbing. <laughs> OK, goodbye. So then Tom says, you want to go to a bar and meet some chicks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go. So I went to hang out with my dad when he was young, right? I mean, how weird is that? But so that's, that's the story of, uh, of that. Um, yes? Good question. So the question is, did, did they come straight from Poland to America, or did they go through another path? Um, uh, Dad was a dentist in Poland, um, and he, he was told that he needed to become a communist. He said, I don't want to become a communist. What, what year is that? Uh, 50s, 1950s. So he was told, if you don't want to become a communist, you're not going to be able to work. Well, that's not good. So I guess there was a program for Holocaust survivors, Jews, to emigrate to Israel. So he was, able to, he was able to take him and his wife and emigrate to Israel. So that was in the late 1950s. He opened up a dental practice there, Ahad um, Kham, in Jerusalem. Uh, they were there for three years, three or four years. The weather really took a toll on my father. He really didn't like that weather. So he, he, their goal was to get to the US if they could. So he got involved with or corresponded with somebody in Chicago that was a, a, a Polish organization. And he was sponsored uh, to come to, to um, America. They first came to New York. 
Um, and he had to apply to dental schools because he couldn't practice. And this was a guy who had already been practicing for a lot of years. So he got accepted to Tufts Dental School and they moved to Boston. Yes, I was born in, uh, in Boston in 1965, so I was on my dad's graduation as a little munchkin. Uh, my sister was, she's a Sabria, she was born in, in um, Tel Aviv. Sure. Yes. So the question is, what was the role of religion in my father's family? Um, they were clearly Jewish. They were not Orthodox. Uh, I don't honestly know how much, how practicing they were. They were very, they were Jewish. They celebrated the um, holidays. What's that? Traditional. Traditionals, yeah. Um, he, okay, I'll share this with you, because my dad was kind of a prankster. I broke up with, I was with a girlfriend for a while, broke up with her, she dated another guy, we got back together. My father says, are you sure? He says, that's Altazachen. I said, what's Altazachen mean? He goes, it's used goods. <laughs> he was a prankster, he had a twisted sense of humor. So he knew Yiddish, but you know, he knew some key words, but they weren't very really, he went to, he converted to Catholicism for my mom. Actually, most of the, the people who were rescued, most, not all, but they converted um, to Christianity. And um, they sell, I'm in touch with many of them. They, they're not interested in their Jewish heritage. They do Christmas, it's one day. My father would say, it's one day, it's not eight days. You know, he'd, he'd make fun of things because when things would go really bad for him, around, he would just stop and start chuckling like laughing and cackling for no reason. It's like, what's wrong? He said, it could be worse. <laughs> it could. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Yes. So what, did your mother participate in the Eichmann trials? Did my mom participate in the Eichmann trials? Um, no, not to my knowledge, because um, it was just my father. He was the one who really witnessed the stuff going on. Let's see, he was born in 1915 and the trial was in 1961. So anybody can do the math real quick? 46, so there you go. And there was another guy, actually, there was a, 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 an SS officer, his name was Schwamberger, and he was what's called the Gauleiter of the, the, um, the ghetto. And he was a really bad guy. He was a, 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 like a real, like a, he, he liked to kill people. And my father saw him do that stuff. And he was caught later, I think it was in 91 or 81, uh, and my dad really wanted to go to that trial. And my mother just lost it. She says, no, no, you're not gonna go. She just didn't want to dredge that stuff up. Even though she was having her, PT well, maybe it was the PTSD, the uncontrollable crying. She was constantly having flashbacks. And the woman was just, you know, and, and the flashbacks were so horrific for her um, uh, it, we would just be at a, my father's 30th uh, reunion from Tufts Dental School and she's sobbing at this reunion and I'm going, oh my gosh, Art Linklater was the headliner there. I go up to Art Linklater, I said, hey, um, could you come over and my mom's kind of not feeling so good? The guy's like, you know, I'm done, I gotta go. He didn't want to get involved. He can't blame him. I mean, he's like, ooh, who's this weirdo? But that, that was kind of, she got dementia, not Alzheimer's, but a dementia. And I have to tell you that dementia is a horrible disease, but it was a gift because she finally forgot. And she went back to being the lighthearted, coquettish young girl um, who she wasn't for so many years. So um, it was, I mean, it was a double-edged sword, but for her, it was a relief. Yes. And when your parents moved to America, uh, where did Helena go? Helena stayed in Poland. So she went through communism. She became a doctor. Uh, so she did well. She got paid about as much as a bus driver. But, um, you know, it was her passion. She stayed. She has a home. She has a daughter. 
Uh, daughter lives with her. Uh, her brain is very sharp, but her body's falling apart. So my mom's body was fine, but her brain fell apart. Right? How did they live in, in one bedroom, one room with, in, the, in, the, in this in Tatarska with German nurses, 13 Jews up above them, and the German nurses had boyfriends who were officers, who were soldiers? And you lived with them for eight months. Eight months. Eight months. Yes, it was a long time. It's, it, uh, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I can't even fathom how they went through that. And the, the stress of all that going on. They didn't know when these people would come in and out, and these 13 would have to be upstairs, and when they, they all had to stay up there. Yeah? Yeah, uh, yes? Is Helen a righteous among the nations? Is Helen a righteous among the nations? Yes, she was also honored as one of the righteous among the nations, although she is kind of silent about what she's done, because, you know, I mean, Poland, you got to be careful who, what you say to whom. She experienced the, um, the, the hatred uh, when she shared with someone what she did. Um, and her own family, I have to tell you this, her own family, my aunts and uncles, turned their backs on Helena and, and Steffi. Uh, after the war, you know, my dad was, he was a professional, so he was doing better, he was making money. He bought his way into the family. He bought my grandmother um, a washing machine. They tolerated him. But yeah, they turned their backs on him. Helena doesn't talk to them. Yes, sir. Could you uh, tell us just a little bit about the Zimmermen who were in the attic? Yes. Uh, sure. So the Zimmermans. Uh, Zimmermans were a family that, that were in the attic, too. They came. There was a mother and two children. Um, uh, Yannick and Sesha Zimmerman uh, were the children. So they, um, they came later uh, and they came under duress. Uh, the mom wanted to survive and she wanted her kids to survive. So she managed to make it so that my mom took her. Let's just put it that way. Um, and I mean, they're good people. It's just, it was a bad time, and you do what you can just to re save yourself and save your, your, your kids. So um, they came in, um, they uh, stayed, I think, I don't remember how many months, but they were on the tail end, so it must have been like 10, 11 months or something like that. Um, and um, I mean, I, they w kind of left after the liberation, they kind of went their own way and we lost touch with them. But interestingly enough, when I was in Los Angeles, I was talking with somebody from the Simon Wiesenthal Center and kind of talking with them about the story. And they said, oh, you know, there's somebody else who has a similar story, who tells a similar story here. Uh, do you know it's Sesha Zimmerman? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so I called my parents and they said, wow, that's fantastic, can we meet? So I, I called the, um, Museum of Tolerance back, I said, yes, I'd like to kind of go and meet. So I went and met with them, just a warm lady, really nice sweetheart lady. Her husband was a really nice guy. They met at a, 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 a DP camp, it was a displaced persons camp after the war. Um, he was a scrapper, he was a schlepper, but he built out a business that uh, they, their, their claim to fame was coonskin hats during the 60s and 70s. That's how he made his fort. Really good people.
And when I was in Poland last November, I went, um, th this, this writer that's writing the book for Scholastic, you, you'll see it in school. It's tentatively titled uh, The Silence Above Us. It's supposed to be released uh, March 2020. I took, the writer wanted me to go to Poland with her to, for research. So we went and we, we wandered around the streets of Przemysl. I got to see all this stuff. It was, that was just mind boggling. But then I, we went to Belzitz, the death camp, um, where my, my family are. Uh, and we, it, that's just a horrible place. Um, one of the administrators, they always ask, do you have people here? Yes, I have people there. We want to talk to you. Okay, so we sit down and we start talking. And I'm share, sharing about, she's sharing stories about the people that are there, and she has a book that she wrote about people's testimonies of family who were, went to Belzitz. Now, Belzitz was one of the, the nasty first concentration camps. It's where the SS learned. It's where they practiced their trade. And um, it, it was a relatively small camp. There's nothing left of it. And there were no records. There's no written documents. They got rid of everything. And you know, the Nazis were good at keeping records on everything. Not a thing. People would come in a train, trains would come, they'd unload, they'd be given um, little round tags with numbers on it, and they were welcomed. Here, take this tag and so you can pick up your luggage later. Put your luggage over there. Now, we all have to go, it's been a long trip, we have to go and we have to get showered, we have to get cleaned up. So leave your clothes here, you'll come back and pick them up, we're gonna wash them for you. Go right down that path and go in and take a shower. There were no barracks at Belzitz. You just walked right in and you were exterminated and dragged out and burned in open pits. They learned their trade. They started out with one or two trains a day and they got up to six trains a day. And I believe this is accurate from what I understood from the, the administrator. She says there were 35 staff sold Nazi SS men. The rest were, there were a couple of other people, there were some um, Ukrainian people that were helping out, but it was all blocked up. 35 staff did all of this. So she was sharing the story and she wrote this book about people's testimonies and she opened up the book to a page and I'm reading this testimony. It's, it's Sesha Zimmerman and Yannick Zimmerman and, and it's like Malvina Zimmerman. I'm like, hey, I know those names. And I told her the story, she goes, Oh my gosh! So there's this like, like, like these things happening with the Zimmermans in our life that they keep popping up all over the place. So <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yes, Chaim was. I will try to uh, name them off. Uh, I'll have to. HolocaustHeroin.com. I created that website for my, my mom after she died, and I've, I've been putting pictures and things. It's a rough website, but it, I put pictures of everybody's names. So my, my uncle Chaim, uh, he was killed in Belzitz. When my dad, uh, he jumped out of a train going to Belzitz. I showed a picture of that, that car. I went by it really quickly. He wanted to commit suicide. Um, he didn't want to go to a camp. He didn't want to be killed. So he was, uh, he was a, a dental technician, so he had a pair of pliers with him. And he managed to cut the barbed wire. And he wanted to be pushed out so he could, be, he could commit suicide. But then he says when he looked down and he sees the tracks and the gravel going by, he's thinking, I'm going to get killed. You wanted to commit suicide. Now you're thinking you're going to get killed? So he says, no, 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 no. Take me back in. Push me out feet first. So he goes out feet first, and the train goes around a bend. And he lets go, and he jumps off out of the train. He gets beat up, and that's what he was saying. I was all bloody and everything. So he survived. Chaim went to Belzitz. His brother, Henek, survived. My mom rescued him. Henek's wife, Danusha, she survived. Um, then there was uh, uh, one of my father's, uh, where he worked, Dr. Leon Schillinger. He was a, an older man who uh, had a dental practice. My father worked for him. He came. Then there were his, uh, uh, his, his nephew, uh, and his name escapes me right now. His nephew, his nephew's wife, 
um, Schillinger's uh, daughter came. She was a young, young girl. Um, uh, her name was, um, her name, they changed her name too. She's such a wonderful lady. I keep in touch with her. She's in, in Brussels. Such a warm hearted lady. Um, and then the Zimmermans. Then there was a postman that they knew who delivered the, the mail. Uh, and I think that's, no, there was, there, that doesn't make 13. That's nine. Okay. <laughs> 11. There, and there, well, there are two more. The names are on the website. And, you know, the older I'm getting, I forget why I walked into the room. I don't know who you people are. Why am I here? <laughs> How did my father get from where he jumped from the train back to town? Good question. So when I was there, I, I looked on a map to see where that curve is. He says it was a curve going left. So I looked on a map. There was only one place in Tremish where there was a, a, a curve going left, and I went to that place. It was probably about a 10-mile hike. He went first to up into the hills to a village where they would go skiing. And there was a little place that my uh, shopkeep that my dad knew and a friend who lived there. So he went up there and he went to his friend's house. And his friend's, he was an elementary school friend. And he said, you know, I just want to stay here for one night before I you know, try to get back to Przemysl. He says, OK. And they felt something weird about this guy. Something wasn't right. He said, no, you just stay here. I'll lock you in so that nobody comes in. And my father's thinking, something's wrong. So he sneaks out, and he goes kind of down the block, and he sees his friend coming with a couple of German soldiers. So he hightails it out of there. And he ended up just kind of walking the 10 miles or so back to Przemysl, and that's where he got to the apartment. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Did you have a question? Why did Helena stay? From what I understand, um, she, uh, she met a guy. It's always, you know, it's always, it's a guy or a girl, you know, and she stayed. And, <laughs> and you know, one thing led to another, so she stayed. One sec. Did somebody have a question back there? No? OK. What was your question, Susan? So they, they had a solution for the snoring and the sneezing. Uh, my dad, you know, I've been told that Max, my father, he was, quote, the, the president of the attic. He was kind of the one that was organizing everything. Um, he, they got a pigeon's feather, and they put it on a twig. So whenever somebody was snoring or somebody was about to sneeze, you know, OK, that would make it go away. And my dad would say they would lie there like sardines, but you know, head, foot, head, foot, head, foot. And there was always somebody on watch looking out the window, the little, small little window. And there was always somebody looking to make sure nobody was coming. And I know, I mean, there's an, there are old people, young people, there's gas, there's, you know, I mean, people having issues. You just had to deal with it. Uh, I won't tell you who, but you want your mind blown? My dad did an abortion up there. That's, that was my look, too. You did what? How'd you do that? You know, there was the wire and... You know, it was one of the 13. I will just leave it at that. I won't say who, but... It was probably one of the women. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think they were around 12, the 10, 12, something along those lines. <laughs> well, I guess the boy was incorrigible. <laughs> he, what's that? No babies. Could not have babies, no. Yes, sir.
that's why I say, you know, you do what you've under duress, people will do what they need to do to survive. And it was, you know, I mean, it's not something that you pleasantly remember, but it's. Yes, the movie was, my mom wanted to make sure that it was very accurate. Um, there, I mean, there were some little things that were changed, but the majority of the story is accurate. And I've read my mom's Polish manuscript. She spent years typing away in English, and her English was broken, but her Polish was, I mean, the Polish was better, well, obviously, but she, I mean, she didn't have a whole lot of schooling, so writing was, she would practice writing. So I read her Polish manuscript and compared it, and a lot of it is mostly accurate, yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. This is the last line. I know your mother didn't want the movie to be portrayed as a love story. Yes. But obviously your parents got together and were married over 50 years, so how was it that the two of them fell in love? In other words, it was a love story. It was a love story. It ended up being, but yeah, it, it turned, well, my mom was in love with, you know, his brother, but he was gone. And, you know, Max and she was, you know, when you're close, when you work so closely together for, you know, and go through so much, you just, a bond formed. So she says he came for one night and he stayed 53 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And thank you for putting up with me. I'm not a professional speaker. I'm just, I'm just keeping my parents' story alive. So.